Train Sim World 3 has officially been announced. The new game will be coming with three new additions. These are Cajon Pass, Schnellfahr Stargate Castle Versberg, and an extension for Southeastern High Speed to Ashford International in Dartford. We'll be talking about what you can expect from these new additions in today's video. I figured instead of talking about each route in a separate video, I thought it would make more sense to make one large video talking about all three new routes. This video will be broken up into three segments talking about each route individually and what they have to offer. I do not own any footage within this video. All rights go to their respective owners and all footage will in this video will be linked in the description. Without further ado, let's start off with the US route, Cajon Pass. Also known as the Cajon Subdivision, Cajon Pass is a busy freight corridor traveling between San Bernardino and Barstow, spanning over 85 miles in length. Cajon, which is Spanish for box, is a major box canyon in the San Bernardino Mountains that was formed by the San Andreas Fault, dividing two mountains to form this massive pass. It is a vital connection for freight trains traveling to and from Southern California. The route is located 65 miles from Los Angeles. The main freight traffic that I see on this route is performed by the Burlington Northern and Santa Fe Railroad, or BNSF for short. Union Pacific trains are also present on the route. This is BNSF's first appearance in Trains in World. The Cajon Pass initially opened in 1885 under the operation of the California Southern Railroad, a subsidiary of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway, or ATSF. It was initially a connection for freight trains between Barstow and San Diego. Modern day, it is also a connection for trains to San Bernardino and Los Angeles. Initially, the line was only a single track starting at around 3% in steepness, and then around a few miles later it would be as steep as 2%. Eventually, the section between the summit and San Bernardino became three tracks, with the two other tracks taking a slightly different path. The initial main line is known as Main 3. This 4 mile 3% green was a massive challenge for freight trains going up and down it. Longer trains were at high risk of becoming a runaway because of these steep gradients, so in 1913, a second track was developed that was 2 miles longer than the initial main line, but had lesser steep gradients up the summit, only getting as steep as 2.2%. This track is called Main 2. Southern Pacific trains also shared the line until in the 1960s, they completed construction of the Palmdale Cutoff. This set of tracks runs partially alongside the Cajon Pass, but is higher up and is mostly single tracked. This set of tracks was designed for UP trains to bypass Los Angeles and Burbank for reduced travel times. Today, most Union Pacific traffic runs on the Palmdale Cutoff, but some still run on the BNSF line. BNSF was heavily expanding the number of trains running on the Cajon Pass, leading to a third track being implemented in 2008. This led to the tunnels being removed from the second track to reduce curvature on the pass. This addition was called Main 1. Today, the Cajon Pass scenes around 70 to 80 BNSF trains and around 20 Union Pacific trains. Now that we know a little bit about the history of the route, let's talk about what you can expect from it. Players will begin in Barso's Major Hump Yard, a major connection to the SEMA, Mojave, Cajon, and Needle subdivisions. A train station can also be found nearby the yard served by Amtrak Southwest Chief, along with a small railroad museum displaying various historic trains. Trains will head southbound through the Mojave Desert passing through very small towns and traveling on relatively flat land with some occasional upward 0.7% gradients. This section also parallels the famous Route 66. Most of the scenery throughout here is mostly dominated by sand and scrub. Freight trains can usually reach speeds of up to 50 to 70 miles an hour along the stretch of the line, while the Southwest Chief can proceed up to 79 miles an hour. Between Victorville and Hesperia, in a small town known as Frost, southbound trains go up and over the other track to be transferred to the opposite side at a crossover. This means that trains run on the left side for the rest of the journey. The main reason trains run on the left south of Frost is because BNSF wants heavier trains going up mains 1 and 2 instead of the steeper main 3. Main 3 is located to the left of the main line, meaning if trains were on the right hand side, they would have to cross over all the tracks at Summit. Because of how busy Cajon passes, this would have led to major congestion issues. Southbound trains can then branch off to the left without interfering with the other tracks, and would still have the option to go right down mains 1 and 2 if necessary. There are also some instances north of Frost where trains run on the left, however, I'm not quite sure what the reasoning is for this. Moving on, once trains reach Victorville, the Southwest Chief makes its second stop. After going through the crossover at Frost, the gradients become a lot steeper, rising up as high as 1.6%. Along the way, trains travel through the small town of Hesperia, where there is a small branch line only accessible by northbound trains. This branch is known as the BNSF Lucerne Valley Subdivision. This is the 32 mile branch line serving the town of Cushenbury. Trains then reach the summit of Cajon Pass, reaching an astounding 4,000 feet above sea level. 
From here on out, this is where players face the ultimate challenge of going down one of the steepest gradients in Train Symbol at a whopping 3% on main 3. Various trains have derailed on this track in the late 80s and 90s going down this dangerous pass. A memorial for a derailment in 1996 is located along this 3% gradient. After a few miles, the gradients lower slightly, going down to 2.2%. Heavier trains will travel to the right instead and go down mains 1 and 2 at a 2.2% gradient the entire way. Nowadays, trains only go down main 3, leading to a very major challenge for players having to endure the extremely steep 3% gradient. However, many trains still go down the cone pass on mains 1 and 2 as well. Now this is where things get a bit confusing, even for me. Trains can run in both directions on these tracks. Heavier trains typically use these sets of tracks to go downhill while lighter trains use main 3. However, there are instances where trains can race each other on these two sets of tracks in either direction. This means that every service will be slightly different as you won't know what track it will be allocated to. Mains 1 and 2 parallel the Union Pacific Palmdale cutoff up above to the right, towering over players. All three tracks then meet up at Cajon, just a few miles after Summit. However, it will not get any easier as players will have to stay at these super steep grins for another 18 to 20 miles. This part of the line is where the scenery really begins to get interesting, as you have all these massive deserted mountains surrounding you. It is the most iconic and scenic part of the route, which is a major reason why many rail fans are so attracted to rail fanning here. Moving on, once trains reach Keenbrook, the Palmdale cutoff breaks away from the BNSF mainline to head over to Union Pacific's West Colton Yard. The BNSF trackage continues down at a relatively steep gradient, but the Southwest Chief is allowed to speed up to 79 miles an hour along this stretch of track. Trains will then finally reach the end of the route at San Bernardino, where players will be greeted with a massive intermodal yard and the Southwest Chief's final stop along this stretch of the route, which is San Bernardino's Santa Fe Depot, where passengers can connect with Metrolink's Inland Empire and San Bernardino lines. From that point, passenger and freight trains continue down to various major Californian cities such as Los Angeles, Orange County, and San Diego. Overall, this route has a lot in store for players, from steep mountain climbing in the San Bernardino Mountains to fast 50 to 70 mile an hour action from Victorville to Barstow, there is a decent amount of variety on this route. Now that we know a little bit about the Gajon Pass, let's talk about the locomotive fleet that will be included on this route. Cajon Pass comes with two locomotives, these include the ES44C4 and the SD40-2. First up, the ES44C4 is a diesel electric locomotive built by General Electric between 2010 and modern day. This is the second ever GEVO to be added to trains in the world. It has a max power output of 4,400 horsepower and a top speed of 75 miles an hour just like any other GEVO. Over 1,200 of these units were built for BNSF. Unlike its predecessor, the ES44AC, the ES44C4 complies with Tier 3 EPA emission standards and has the ability to redistribute tractive effort to only the outer axles to allow for improved grip in the event of the train being at risk of wheel slip. Moving on, the SD40-2 is a diesel electric locomotive built by AMD between 1972 and 1989. BNSF owns over 800 of these units. It has a max power output of 3,000 horsepower and a top speed of 65 miles an hour. In terms of rolling stock, the route includes auto racks, tank cars, box cars, maxi stack fours, and a brand new bulkhead flat car. Now there are a few missed opportunities for locos and rolling stock that are commonly seen on this route. I think the route should have included traditional flat cars used for trailers, covered hoppers, and center beam cars. Flat cars are primarily used on most intermodal trains in the United States. They can be used to carry both containers and trailers. Covered hoppers are also commonly seen on manifest trains, as BNSF carries a lot of cement on the Cajon Pass. Center beams are also very commonly seen on manifest trains. Hopefully at some point we could see these get added to the route. Now when it comes to Loco DLCs, Dovetail Games could add mainline Locos such as the GEC44-9W, the SD70ACE, and possibly some other GEVO variants. Now when it comes to switching in local use, Dovetail Games could also add Locos such as the EMD GP60 and possibly the EMD GP60M-3. Now a lot of people may say that they should add the P42DC to this route, but Cajon Pass only sees the Southwest Chief which is only 2 trains a day. This route is definitely not the right route to introduce it on. Last but not least, let's talk about what the gameplay could be like. Let's start with switching in local services. BNSF San Bernardino Intermodal Yard and Barstow Hump Yard will allow for a very good amount of switching on the route. Barstow Yard consists of over 40 tracks and is overall a massive yard. 
We will also be getting Trains in World 2's first intermodal yard in San Bernardino. This means that all switching in this yard will be with intermodal containers. This means that all switching in this yard will be with intermodal containers. Something I really hope to see get added is animated container cranes loading and unloading intermodal cars to really give that sense of immersion. Switches will have lots to do in both of these yards, so I expect to see a decent amount of services. I'm anticipating around 20 to 30 switching services performed by the SD40-2 or any sort of switcher. There are also various facilities along the route that local trains can serve. There are a couple of facilities along the mainland in the San Bernardino located in Ono, Verdmont, and Keenbrook. Closer to Barso, there are also cement facilities in Oro Grande and Victorville. Now I'm unsure if these facilities would be served by the SD40 since they are a decent distance from Barstow, but it's definitely a possibility since the grains aren't too steep along this part of the route. It is also possible that there are SD40s that do switching in both cement facilities and then just have a Jeevo pick up the rolling stock that has been prepped by the SD40s. There's also a small facility located on the Lucerne Valley subdivision that locals could serve as well. In total I could see around 10-15 to 15 local services for the SD40. This adds up to about 30 to 45 total services for the SD40. Now let's talk about mainline services. Most of them will simply just be traveling between San Bernardino and Barstow. It is also possible that services may be broken in half to reduce travel times in each service. Dovetail games could have services that end at the summit of the passage or possibly in somewhere like Hesperia or Victorville. It is also possible we may see a couple of yard services done by the Jeevo since Barstow does have a locomotive shop, so it definitely is a possibility. Something that is also seen from time to time on the Cajon Pass is massive power moves. This is when BNSF lashes up around a dozen locomotives to get most of them to where they need to be. These can be seen on a typical free train or they run with no free cars at all. This is yet to be done in Train Sim World. I think it would be really awesome to see this get added as this is something that does happen quite often on most American freight railroads. Now as mentioned before, Cajon Pass seems around 70 to 80 BNSF trains. If services are split like on Sherman Hill, I could see 150 to 170 services performed by the ES44 C4. One thing I found really cool is that Dovetail Games just confirmed on the August 10th roadmap that there will be a scenario on the Cajon Pass where there will be a wildfire. How awesome is that? And as a Californian, I can definitely say wildfires happen here all the time. If this also happens at nighttime, that could look super awesome, especially with the new lighting system that's coming with Train Sim World. Dovetail Games also confirmed on the TSW3 Q&A stream that there will also be a service that has 4 locos leading, 2 units in the middle of the train, and 2 units on the rear. BNSF will have a lot to offer on this route, which is why I am super excited to see it in the game. Now let's talk about Union Pacific. UP does perform freight on this route as they as a matter of fact own the trackage on most of the Cajon Pass. UP performs around 20 freight services every day. Now this is where things get a bit interesting. Union Pacific has a lot of potential on this route. Something that would be cool to see in the future is for the route to be extended to West Colton Yard down in San Bernardino and Daggett Yard located a few miles east of Barso Yard. These yards are exclusive to only Union Pacific trains. This will allow for a lot longer UP services. Without either extension, UP trains will have services such as San Bernardino to Barstow, just like the BNSF trains, or Keenbrook to Summit. One thing I'm unsure about, however, is if there are trains that go from West Colton Yard and head down to Barstow. Under the impression that they do not, most UP traffic will be on the Palmdale Cutoff. Services can begin somewhere such as the Signal in Keenbrook since this is where the Palmdale Cutoff merges with the Cajon Pass. Once the Cutoff gets to the summit, trains then branch off to the left and head towards Mojave. There is a siding about where the route splits off so this is probably where services should end. The main rolling stock that can be added for Union Pacific on this route are the SD70 AC from Sherman Hill and the AC4400 CW from Cane Creek as these locos can be seen relatively often on UP trains. If we ever get a Union Pacific Jeevo or SD70M at some point, those would be very viable layers to add to this route. Coal cars from Sherman Hill should also be layered onto this route for UP trains as coal trains are seen quite often. Delta Games has not yet confirmed if Union Pacific will be layered onto this route, so we can only hope for now. Foreign power can also be seen on this route. The most notable one would be Nofolk Southern. Delta Games could layer Horseshoe Curves ES44 AC onto this route. These can be seen on some BNSF trains as additional power and sometimes even lead some BNSF trains. Now when it comes to solely Norfolk Southern trains, I have seen some coal and intermodal trains. Tuthel Games showed off the ES44 C4 sounds on the most recent roadmap stream. Here is a clip of their sounds.
Hopefully this means that Skyo could implement these newer sounds to the Horseshoe Curvy S44. I could probably see up to 5 Nofolk Southern surfaces on this route. It also isn't too far fetched to have a CSX as a foreign power on this route, but most likely as any sort of road train. I've seen them on helper units and sometimes additional power for other trains. It would be cool to see the CSX AC4400 CW as a layer and make an appearance on at least one or two trains. Adding up all these services, I can honestly see up to 190 to 240 playable services on this route. Cajon Pass has the potential of being one of the busiest and best US freight routes in the game. This route is something for almost any freight fan, whether that being carrying heavy tonnage across some of the steepest gradients in California, 50 to 70 mile an hour runs through the Mojave Desert, switching services in various massive yards, and local action serving various facilities. Although this route may not be for everyone, it will make a great addition to the US freight route collection. I think it has the potential of being better than routes such as Horseshoe Curve and Sherman Hill. As someone who lives not too far from this route and have visited it in real life, I can definitely say that I am very excited to see this route get added to the game. Schnellfahr Strecke kassel Würzburg is a high-speed line train between kassel Wilhelmshöhe and Würzburg Habanov. This stretch of the line is 186 km or 115 miles and has a total of 3 stops. This makes kassel Würzburg the longest route in train in the world by a landslide. Trains will be able to reach speeds of up to 280 km an hour or 170 miles an hour on this route, making it the fastest German route in the game. This route is part of the Hanover Würzburg High Speed Line, one of the first high speed lines to ever be built in Germany. Deutsche Bahn began construction on this line in 1973. The line was designed for fast passenger trains and, and express freight trains. Because of this, the line was designed to not have any gradients steeper than 1.25%, so trains can travel at the highest possible speeds. Engineers faced the challenge of building this high speed line through the Hesse and Bavaria countryside, which consists of mostly hilly terrain. This led to over 60 tunnels and 10 large viaducts being constructed. 50 of these tunnels are on Kassel Würzburg. Although the route is 327 kilometers, 130 of them are in tunnels. Viaducts on this route also allow for some really astounding views of the surrounding countryside. This will be a great route to take screenshots on as there are countless amounts of viaducts trains will be traveling over. This is what makes Kassel Würzburg so much different than Kolnaken and Munich Augsburg. Instead of ICE trains running on a certain mainland with various other types of traffic, they're running on track which is solely designed for them. So let's briefly talk about the route. Trains will begin their journey out of Kassel Wilhelmshöhe. You also already have LZB enabled. About a kilometer north of the station, a freight yard can be found where freight trains will begin their journey. Trains will head south breaking away from the regional lines that serve the station to get onto the high speed line by an underpass. They will then race up to 250 to 280 kilometers an hour along the Hesse countryside and Bundesautobahn 7, the longest motorway in Europe. You will be cutting through the countryside in dozens of tunnels and go flying over the countryside on several massive viaducts. Trains will then eventually reach Fulda 86 kilometers later. Some ICE trains then branch off of the route to head to places such as Frankfurt. Other trains will continue down the line racing through the Bavaria landscape to Würzburg. Along the way, trains will travel through Landjungen Tunnel, the longest tunnel on the Hanover Würzburg High Speed Line at 10 kilometers in length. In addition, players will also be traveling over the Rombach Valley Bridge, the tallest viaduct on the route at 95 meters in height or 311 feet in the sky. Trains will also travel over the Jamunden High Speed Viaduct, passing over the popular main Spessa Bahn formerly seen in Trainsim World. After traveling through a tunnel, players will emerge out of the massive Vine Pavilion and be greeted by the beautiful town of Würzburg. Photographers and train spires may also be watching from the top of the Vine Pavilion on the Wetterschut Schutte, an observation deck overlooking Würzburg. Trains will then slow down and eventually leave LZB territory as this is the end of the high speed line. Trains will then be under PZB for the rest of the journey. The high speed line merges back up with the main Spessabahn and then travels into Würzburg Habanov. Now that we know a little bit about the route, let's talk about the rolling stock that will be coming with this route. The base route will be including the DBBR401, the DBBR403, and the DBBR185.2. Starting with the ICE-1, the DBBR401 is an electric train set manufactured by Siemens Mobility between 1989 and 1993. 
This is the first generation of the ICE family. It has a max power output of 9,600 kilowatts or 12,874 horsepower and a top speed of 280 kilometers an hour or 170 miles an hour. 60 of these train sets were built for Deutsche Bahn. They have undergone multiple refurbishments to stay in service, with the most recent one being in 2019. The IC1 can also be layered onto various other German routes such as Hopstecker Rhein Ruhr, Munich Augsburg, Hamburg Lubeck, and Rhein Ruhr Austin. It is super exciting to see this train get added to Trains the World as it is one of the most popular ICE trains in the fleet. It is definitely going to be a very interesting driving experience and is a very welcoming addition to Trains in World 3. It has been confirmed that Mike from Trains in Germany did lots of the work on the IC1, so it should be very high in quality. Next up, the DBPR 403 is an electric multiple unit also built by Siemens in 1997. This is the third generation of the ICE family. It has a max power output of 8,000 kilowatts or 10,728 horsepower and a top speed of 330 kilometers an hour or 205 miles an hour. Now I do have a problem with this train being added to this route, but I'll get into that later on in the video. Last but not least, the DBBR 25.2 is a dual cab electric locomotive built by Bombardier and Alstom in 1998. This locomotive is part of the famous Alstom Tracks family. The 25 will be performing freight operations on this route. It has a max power output of 7,500 horsepower and a top speed of 140 km an hour or 87 miles an hour. Although we have seen this logo on various other trains and world routes, it definitely adds some variety to the route. It has also been confirmed by Dovetail Games that the 25.2 has received substantial upgrades with improved sounds, physics, and LZB functionality. There are a couple of other trains that run on this line that I think should be added in the near future. A very common site on this route is the ICET. These are used on lots of different services on this route. It can also be layered onto various other routes such as Riesa Dresden, Hopstucker Rhein Ruhr, Rhein Ruhr Austin, Hamburg Lubeck, and Munich Augsburg. Then there is the ICE 4. Although not as common as the ICE T, they are still a common sight to see on this route. Then we have the ICE 2. These are a lot less common on the route, but can still be seen from time to time on various ICE services. Last but not least, we have the OBB 1116 Taurus. These locos, alongside sleeper coaches, will be performing nightjet services along the route. After doing some research, Nightjet runs two of its services along Kassel Würzburg, meaning we would get four services for it. Now let's talk about gameplay. There are various ICE services that run on Kassel Würzburg. These include ICE 12, ICE 13, ICE 20, ICE 22, ICE 25, ICE 26, ICE 41, and ICE 91 services. ICE 12 and ICE 13 services travel only between Kassel and Fulda. Both lines then head down to Frankfurt, leaving the route. ICE 20 and ICE 22 services would not be playable as both trains skip Fulda and head to Frankfurt as well. ICE 25, ICE 26, ICE 41, and ICE 91 services will all be running along the entire route between Kassel and Würzburg. There are also a couple of IC trains that run along the route, this being IC Line 26. It is only a single round trip on the route and will be performed by the DBBR 101 with IC coaches. This means that we will have two IC services. It is also possible that the 101 may substitute for nitrogen services as these do run on Kassel Würzburg. Now the problem I mentioned earlier with the IC3 is that in real life, the IC3 is only seen on Line 41. There is only one ICE 41 service that travels on Kassel Würzburg. This means we would only get two ICE 3 services on the route. I looked all over the internet to see if it runs on any other ICE service that I just mentioned, but I was unable to find anything. This is why I hope at some point Dovetail Games adds the ICE T to this route, as it runs on the ICE 12, ICE 13, ICE 25, ICE 26, and ICE 91. This route would be a great opportunity to add the ICE T on, as they are a very common sight. As I mentioned before, it can also be layered onto various other routes so sooner than later I could see Dovetail Games adding this highly requested train to train some world sooner than later. For the time being however, I see them having the IC3 substitute for the ICT until we get a proper DLC for it. One thing I forgot to mention however is that the gameplay between the IC1 and IC3 will be very different on this route. Since the IC3 is a lighter train, there are a lot more risks of them traveling over some of the massive viaducts on the route at very high speeds. 
Telltale Games has stated that Elza B will behave differently on the IC1 and IC3, leading to some really interesting gameplay. Most likely, the IC3 will be traveling at slower speeds over the viaducts while the IC1 will be traveling closer to line speed. Last but not least, we have Freight. Freight will most likely be doing services route between Castel and Fulda, or do full length runs. What makes Freight interesting on this route, however, is that most of it runs at night time. Most people may think that the line is relatively quiet at night, but this route is an exception to that. Freight runs late at night to prevent delays of ICE trains during the day. However, there are still some ICE trains running through the night. Since passenger trains have priority over freight trains in Germany, there are instances where freight trains will have to pull around to sidings along the route to let ICE trains overtake them. This could lead to some really interesting freight gameplay as this is only really seen on routes like hamburg lubeck Castle Würzburg has the potential of having some of the most interesting high speed and freight gameplay in the game. Now in terms of how many services that I could see on Castle Würzburg, I could see around 120 to 140 playable services. I think this brew was a great choice by Dovetail Games to do for a proper high speed brew. It allows for some very different gameplay compared to the two other high speed lines we already have in the game. It is also great to see the IC1 finally in Train Sim World. This route makes her a very welcoming addition to the game, and I am super excited to see this route coming to Train Sim World 3. Since Southeastern High Speed has been out for about a year now, I don't think we need to talk about the route itself. This segment will mostly be focusing on the new extensions we will be getting. Delta Games will be extending Southeastern High Speed from Epsley International to Ashford International and from Gravesend to Dartford. This makes the route 90 miles long and adds an additional 6 stations to the route. The route will be coming with the Class 395 Javelin, the Class 375 Electrostar, the Class 465 Networker, and the Class 66. Dovetail has confirmed that the 375 will be getting the Armstrong Powerhouse Electrostar sounds heard on Brighton Mainline. They also confirmed that the Class 66 will be getting brand new sounds from Armstrong, along with the 395 getting minor sound upgrades. Now let's talk about each extension individually and how they will benefit the gameplay as a whole. Starting with the Ashford extension. Ashford International is along the final stretch of the HS1 line. The extension is a total of 33 miles in length and adds only one additional station to the route. It was the first portion completed of the HS1, opening in September of 2003. Construction was still underway on the section between Epsley and London St. Pancras. However, it reduced travel time significantly by 21 minutes for Eurostar trains. During initial safety testing of this stretch of the line, speeds of 334 km an hour or 208 miles an hour were achieved. Today, the line is served by not only Eurostar trains but also domestic southeastern trains bound for Margate and Dover Priory. Starting at Stratford International, trains speed along the HS1 until they reach Epsley International. However, instead of diverging from the HS1 up to the upper level of Epsley, trains will rather make a scheduled stop on the lower level of the station or go straight through at full speed. Dovetail has completely upgraded the station to make it more realistic, along with making its main concourse interactable for players to explore. Trains will then race along the Kent countryside at speeds of 225 km an hour alongside the M2 and M20 motorways. Along the way, trains will speed over the Medway Viaduct, a 3 quarter mile long viaduct traveling over the River Medway. Trains will travel through many curves and steep gradients along the way, similar to LGV Mediterranean. Trains will then reach Ashford International, where southeastern trains then continue down to Margate and Dover Priory. Eurostar trains will continue their journey thundering down the line towards the Channel Tunnel. This extension will be used only by the Class 395 Javelin, however there are three additional trains that can also be used along this stretch of the line. The first and most obvious trains are none other than the Eurostar E300 and E320. These trains will be performing high speed services along the HS1, reaching speeds of up to 300 km an hour. Eurostar has been something that has been highly requested by many people on the forums for a very long time now. However, there are a couple of issues with Eurostar on this route. First and foremost, licensing. Telltale Games has said that they've had many issues trying to obtain a Eurostar license. This most likely means that we won't see Eurostar on this route anytime soon until they are able to obtain one. The second issue is that there are a decent amount of trains that do not stop at Epsley nor Ashford. There is a set of bypass tracks located right next to the station that non-stop trains use to skip the station at full speed. 
This means that there would not be a lot of playable services, as lots of Eurostar trains don't even serve Ashford. As much as I would love to see Eurostar on this route, I still find it relatively unlikely that we will ever see either of these trains get added to the game. The only other logo that runs on this route is actually a freight logo. This is the Class 92. This is an electric freight logo used for freight services along the HS1. Five of these units have been upgraded to have TV and in-cap signaling on board. Freight trains will be doing services between London and Poland. I personally don't see this train getting added to this route either, simply because the HS1 doesn't see a lot of freight at the moment. From what I was able to find, the HS1 only sees a couple of freight trains a week, so this is definitely not the right route to introduce the 92 on. In terms of the gameplay on this extension, this is where things get a bit interesting. Southeastern trains will be doing services to and from Ashford International. However, there will also be some that do not stop at Epsley, primarily during peak hours. Southeastern also has its main depot for the Javelins located at Ashford. This means that trains will also get to go to and from the depot all the way to London St. Pancras without stopping anywhere. This will lead to some super interesting gameplay. Modern day, Southeastern runs 80 services between London and Ashford. There will also be a decent amount of depot services done by the Javelin. In the current Southeastern high speed, the Javelin has 59 services. With this new extension, I could see around 150 to 160 playable services for the Javelin. This extension was a great call by Dovetail Games, as this will give the Javelin many more services for players to enjoy, along with adding more high speed action for players who enjoyed the HS1 portion of the route. Let's now move on to the Dartford extension. This will extend the route from Gravesend to Dartford Station, adding an additional 6 miles and 5 stations to the route. Starting in Gravesend, trains will run down the line like normal, where high speed services would travel to the left to head to Ebsley International, commuter trains will continue straight and then eventually cross over the HS1. Trains will then call at Northfleet, Swanscombe, Greenhith, Stone Crossing, and finally, Dartford. The line then splits into three different lines to head towards Charing Cross and Cannon Street. Along the way, trains will travel through the suburbs of eastern London along with running relatively close to River Thames. This line will be served solely by the Class 465. Before we talk about other rolling stock that could be added to this route, let's talk about the gameplay. Now some people may think that this extension means we will have longer services from Raynan. However, these services do not actually exist in real life. All I was able to find was that there are occasional services between London Charing Cross and Gillingham, and London Charing Cross to Ramsgate. So what does this mean in terms of gameplay then? With Joe upgrading the timetable for this route, services will be very different than what we are used to on the original Southeastern High Speed. First and foremost, the 375 will only be running between Rochester, Gillingham, and Faversham. The 465 will also perform these kinds of services. There is only one type of service that runs on the brand new extension, and that is Sidcup Line services, travel between London Charing Cross and Gravesend. This means players will be performing services between Gravesend and Dartford. This may sound disappointing to some players, but this is what is done in real life. However, there will still be a couple of limited services that run on between the Channel Main Line and the North Kent Line. Now in terms of the number of services that would be seen on this line, there would be around 100 services for the Class 65 running between Gravesend and Dartford. Now that we know this, what trains are used to serve Raynham? The answer to that is Thameslink. Thameslink operates its Raynham to Bedford services on this line. Trains will travel between Raynham and Dartford. At night, some trains only go as far as Gillingham to be stored in the storage facility located there. Trains will be calling at all stops along the route. This would be a great opportunity to introduce the Class 700 on as it can also be layered onto Brighton Mainline. Thameslink also runs a lot of trains on this service, running up to about 80 services. Adding this up with the services that can be done by the 465, this adds up to about 180 to 190 services. Now other than the Class 700, what else can be added to this route? Southeastern has two different classifications for their lines. These include main lines and metro lines. Main lines are primarily services that travel relatively long distances far from London. Metro lines primarily stay within 20 to 30 miles within the London area. The 375 currently operates only on mainline services such as the Chatham Mainline. The 465 can be used on both mainlines and metro services. The Sipcup line is classified as a metro line. Now in terms of loco DLCs, one train can be added for just mainline services, two trains can be added to just metro services, and one can be added to both kinds of lines. Starting with mainline only, we have the Class 377-5. 
Between 2016 and 2017, all 23 of them were acquired by Southeastern. The most notable difference between the, the Slash 5 and the Slash 4 variant is that the 377 Slash 5 is a dual voltage train. This means it has both a Panagraph and a third rail shoe similar to the Class 387. There are also some other small cosmetic changes between the two trains, but that is the most significant difference between the two. This would be a nice addition to the route as it would add some additional variety. Next up we have the Class 707. These are some of the newest trains within Southeastern's fleet, acquiring 18 of them from the Southwestern Railway in 2021. Eventually, the remaining 12 units will be transferred to Southeastern by sometime this year. This would also be a very welcoming addition to the route as they are relatively similar to the Class 700. Another common sight on Graysun shuttle services is the Class 376. These are some of the stranger units in the Electrostar family as they have no gangway door on the front and instead have a full-on windshield. These units also only have a top speed of 75 miles an hour. Southeastern has 36 of these units. These would also be interesting units to see as these are some of the more unique units within the Electrostar fleet. Last but not least, we have the Class 466. These units are used on both mainline and metro line services. Although it may have a similar appearance to the Class 465, there's one key difference between the two trains. Other than the fact that the 466 has only two coaches, these units have a bathroom on board while the 465 does not. Since the 466 has also two end cars, only one of them is powered. These have been a lot less common on the Southeastern network due to accessibility issues they have. As of 2021, they are only allowed to be coupled up with 465s. Some will be getting replaced by the 707s that are now entering service, making them even less common. These units are pretty unlikely to be added to the route as they basically do the exact same duties as the 465. However, it would still be cool to see these units one day. So there we have all the new trains that can be added to Southeastern High Speed. However, something additional that can be done is for Dovetail Games to make a 3 car Class 375. These are also seen from time to time on the route, having 10 of these units. There are not a lot of major differences between the 3 car and the 4 car versions, so I wouldn't imagine this being too difficult for Dovetail Games to add at some point. Now let's briefly talk about how many services I could see in this updated Southeastern High Speed, along with some other improvements that will be seen on this route. First and foremost, Southeastern High Speed is getting a scenery upgrade. This route was known for having some of the worst scenery in Trainsim World. This is another reason I'm very happy to see this route get extended, as Dovetail Games took the time to make the scenery a lot more presentable. I have high hopes that the scenery will be a lot better on Southeastern High Speed because of this upgrade. Delta Games has also confirmed that all platforms alongside the Southeastern platforms at London St. Pancras will be explorable. This was something that was deeply criticized by the community as, as Southeastern only has three platforms at London St. Pancras. This is great for players who, who enjoy to explore major stations in Trainsome World. Epsley International will also be getting a major upgrade. Before, you were only able to explore the upper level of the station. The lower level didn't have any level of detail put into it. Duffel Games has revisited the station to make it much more realistic, along with making the interior of the station completely explorable, which is super awesome to see. Last but not least, this route is getting a major timetable upgrade, and it will be done by none other than Joe Bergs. Every timetable he has made has always been amazing. I'm super excited to see what sort of interesting services he will put into the Southeastern's new timetable. Not only that, but we will also be getting a substantially higher amount of services because of these two extensions. As I mentioned before, the Java will most likely have around 150 to 160 playable services.
Overall, Southeastern High Speed could become one of the best UK routes within the game because of these brand new extensions, various improvements, and a brand new timetable. I'm super happy that Dovetail Games revisited this route as it was in desperate need of improvements. Although we didn't get a new UK route within Trainsome World 3, I think what's in store for Southeastern High Speed will completely make up for that as it expands the possibilities that this route could provide in many different ways. I'm very excited to see this new and improved Southeastern High Speed when the game drops on September 6. And there you have it folks, everything you need to know about each new route coming to Train Slim World 3. I hope you were able to learn a thing or two about each route, cause now there's a quiz. Wait, you're telling me you didn't take any notes? I'm disappointed in all of you. I'm just kidding. But I have a question to ask all of you. What are you most excited about in Train Slim World 3? Now for me personally, I'm super excited about zipping along the German countryside in a thunderstorm driving the classic icy one on Kassel Versberg. Let me know what you guys are excited for about in the comment section below. I would love to hear from you guys. If you found this video interesting, consider liking the video and hitting that subscribe button for more Train Some World 3 content and streams. I hope you all enjoyed this video and I will see you all in the next one. This is Crazy Dash, peace out.